this will be to the color. All right. Yari Villanueva commissioned me to make a playable replica of his Bach Stradivarius field trumpet. We decided to take it a step further and build a replica of the Bach Stradivarius that was used for President Kennedy's funeral. This is a finished view of my final wooden bugle, carved from Movinge, a dense gold-colored wood from West Africa, laying next to Yari's number six Strad. In this video I will tell and show how I built this beautiful work of functional art. This is a side view of the Kennedy Bugle. There, there are some minor details that distinguishes the Kennedy Bugle from the later Bach Stradivarius instruments. One detail is shown in this picture, and that is the two extra braces between the lead pipe and the tuning slide. The first step in building an instrument is to create a drawing package or a set of rough blueprints for the instrument, without doing any damage to the original. I place strips of scotch tape down the center line of the instrument and make marks every inch. I can calculate the total length of the instrument this way and also determine where certain features are along the length. Here is a schematic I drew for the Stradivarius. By measuring the wall thickness of the tubing at the tuning slide, I found it to be 17 and a half thousandths of an inch, or 0 0.0175. Along the green center line, I would measure the outside diameter and subtract 35 thousandths of an inch to get the inside diameter, or bore. I did this for the entire length of the instrument and found that 27 and a quarter percent of the instrument was made of straight tubing and the other 72 and three quarter percent is made of cone-shaped tubing. This ratio is what determines the exact pitches of the notes that can be played on it. On the last instrument I did, the Getzen American Heritage, I noticed that it had a ratio of 28.8 percent straight. I think this would slightly change the intonation perhaps unnoticeable to the untrained ear. These are pictures of the wood that I ordered for the project. Figured Movinge, special ordered from Gilmer Wood Supply in Oregon. I told the manager about the special project and he handpicked pieces for me. For the entire bugle, I only needed a piece, two inches thick, 24 inches long, and six inches wide, but I bought an extra just in case. The first step is to cut the wood into four inch long pieces. I bore them out using a drill the same size as the bore of the instrument through the straight tubing section. In this case, 0.459, which was exactly what they advertised. I cut those sections up on the bandsaw into rectangular blocks and pre-round them with the disc sander by eye. I then used the same drill bit that I bored them out with to mount them on the lathe and turn the outside dimension down to 0.705 this gives a wall thickness of 0.123, or about an eighth of an inch. The picture says two hours total, but it was three and a half if you include doing the schematic drawing. At the four hour mark, I have started cutting up those pieces of tubing into individual angled sections to build the rounded tubing. I designed the angles using a CAD program, 
Each piece has an 11 and a quarter degree angle on each face. As far as building the round sections, all I need to take into the shop with me is a basic drawing which shows the inside and outside lengths. Each 180 degree bend uses nine pieces, seven with bevels on both sides and two with bevels on one side. I clamp a fixture to my disc, disc sander uh, to my disc sander table for the first angle and slowly remove uh, wood for the second angle until the dimensions are spot on to the drawing. The Kennedy has a unique feature on the tuning slide incorporating a D-shaped crook. I tried to design it for nine sections but ended up doing 13 custom angled pieces to get the correct bend. I learned this technique by watching a Discovery Channel show about large bore underground tunnels with segmented concrete sections that are angled to make turns. I try to start at one point and work my way through the instrument. At this point I'm getting ready to build the upper braces to connect the slide tubing to the lead pipe section, but I have to be careful to allow room for the next 180 degree section to clear the first. Since the outside dimension of the tubing is different from the original, I have to make adjustments to try to retain the original look as much as possible but most importantly keep the interior dimensions perfect. The upper braces look almost like pancakes. They were very difficult to make because of how small they were. Here is another thing that makes the Kennedy Bugle unique. The serial number is 1962-1, the first and only Bach Stradivarius made in 1962. I keep working my way through the instrument section at a time and at this point I'm ready to build the lower braces. To make the rounded triangular brace pads, I turn tubes that will slide over the section they are going to go on. Then I cut those tubes in half, and I draw the profiles for the triangles, and sand off the corners using the disc sander. Here I have turned the decorative pieces that go between the pads on one stub, so I can cut them off with a pair of wire cutters. These small parts can fly off out of your hand easily when sanding them with the Dremel. I dry fit them and make pencil marks where the corners are going to go. I make sure the pencil marks are far enough away from the corners so I can erase them after. Then I put a tiny bit of glue on them and hold them in place with my fingers. On a complex piece like this, sometimes the only way I can clamp pieces together is to just hold them for a while with my hands. And here's what it looks like after. It's very tricky keeping all the tubing perfectly parallel so the tuning slide doesn't bind. Most 180 degree bends are fairly easy but this next section has an added pain. The inner bore is part of the cone-shaped section, so it has to increase in size as it bends. I've calculated this on paper here. I cut the pieces same as before, but starting with extra thick walls. I number them the same as the paper so I can keep track of which one they are. Then I put each one of them into the lathe and bore out the insides to the exact individual sizes. Here you can see them increasing in size, it's an optical illusion, but they're all the same diameter on the outside for now, and the hole is getting bigger from left to right. I always start gluing in the middle of a bend so I can glue two pieces on at a time to, uh, to save time. What's not shown here is after each section dries, I round the inside and finish sand it with a Dremel while I can reach that section and slowly add more sections and continue to round the inside and, and work my way through the piece. This is me making one of the decorative bushings. I use my boring bar and turn the lathe on in reverse. Then I part the piece off and finish it with the Dremel. Here is that tapered 180 degree section glued in place to the left. I'm starting to get into the bell section here so the taper is increasing a lot. I turn these on the lathe and taper them inside and out by manipulating both dials simultaneously. And here's a view from the other side. Notice how the sections are short here and stepped slightly. I had to leave a straight area to grab it with a lathe while I did the tapering. I ground off the steps with various Dremel sanding bits afterwards. I hate doing bells. They're very time consuming and difficult to maintain a consistent wall thickness and correct taper, especially by having to move both dials simultaneously. I have to plan this out carefully and leave flat areas that I can grab with the lathe as I work on both sides. Double check fit and shape over and over on this critical piece. And here I am checking again. Here I am final sanding it and turning the bead. It doesn't really have a function on a wooden instrument other than looking a little more authentic. When the bell is all done, 
I feel pretty confident that I could place it on the original Bach bell mold and it should drop right in, right in place, plus or minus five thousandths of an inch here and there. Bell in place and steps ground smooth, just a few details left to go. Gluing the loop brace pads in place, I didn't feel like holding this so I wrapped twine around it tightly and set it aside for a while. Turning the rope loops, I detail and finish sand them in place, then I part them off and here it is glued in place. Hand drawing the logo with Pigma Micron India ink pens. No room for error here. I lay it all out in mechanical pencil first and work extremely slowly. On the piece of paper on the left you can see the traced logo. I put a piece of scotch tape on the metal bugle and traced the signature onto the tape so I could see it better. I work in my lap on a stool at the kitchen bar. Pretty low tech here. Sometimes I use the computer monitor to zoom in and see the details better. I have drawn a center line as a reference and I draw that same line on the wooden one. I try my best to match the same fonts. It looks a little dirty here because the pencil marks are still there. Here is everything all done with the pencil lines still showing. After it is definitely completely dry so I don't smudge the ink, I carefully erase the pencil marks and you can see the original stamped logo on the Kennedy Bugle here. I'm kind of fussy about my signature so I try it out a number of times on printer paper until I get the one I like. I cut it out and pencil up the back to do a carbon copy. I tape this piece of paper onto the wood where I want it and use a ballpoint pen to rub the signature on, kind of how they transfer tattoo designs I guess. Here you can see the faint pencil marks that I go over with the ink pens to finish it. The final steps are to clear coat everything. I like using Minwax polyurethane in the silver and gray can. It builds up quick and has a nice high gloss amber appearance. Sometimes I have to get creative with holding the instrument while it dries. I've put a dowel up through the lead pipe and clamped the dowel to the side of a bookcase. Extra humidity in the air can screw up a good finish so the air should be ideally as dry as possible. I apply the finish with uh, foam brushes. Here's what it looked like. The figure really stands out well. It's much better in person too where you can move it around and see the depth of the figure. I forgot to get a completely finished view before Yari took delivery but this view is almost complete minus the rope loops.